John chapter 5. I want to read from verse 9. Let's stand as we read God's word. Let's read from verse 9 to 18. But our focus this morning is on verses 15 to 18. But let's read from verse 9. And the title of our study is Four Rejections from the World, Part 2. Verse 9b, now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to them, or to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath, and it's not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well, do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing this Things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working for this reason. Therefore, the Jews are seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. You, you may now take your seat. Father, we're thankful for your word this morning. Help us to understand, teach us, give us the understanding that we need and illumination from the Holy Spirit. And so as we uh, begin the year 2023, uh, we call it New Year, as if there is new under the sun. We know better than that. The book of Ecclesiastes said, uh, generation comes and generation goes but the earth remains forever. But at the same time, we believe that God's grace is new every morning. As Christians, we don't stay the same every day. The Lord is working in our lives nonstop, daily. He's changing us into the image of His Son daily. If you turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we read, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. The word workmanship is the Greek word poema. That's where we get the word poem. We are God's masterpiece. He's changing us, He's renewing us, and you can be assured that if you are in Christ, God is at work in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. And I pray that we're all excited this year, and I pray that you are excited about God's uh, work in your lives, how the Lord will work in us and, and through us this year or what kind of challenges that will purify you as you look forward uh, this year. And I am thrilled about what God said before us. This year, um, both as a church and, and individually, and as a true Christian, you will experience positive uh, change in your life this year. But only the true Christian has this positive changes, hopeful changes uh, in life this year because we need to be reminded that though we face a, a new year, our world is not getting new every year. Our world is not getting better. It's just another year of rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic and the world is on, on a complete crash collision course with God, and it's not new. 
That's what has been happening since the fall of Adam and Eve. Since then, uh, we see people rejecting Christ. And as we see in our text, there are four rejections from the world. Whatever uh, generations that we have, whatever year or wherever you go, people are rejecting Christ. The world rejects our Savior. They reject God's law. Uh, People add man-made tradition or regulation to fit their idea about God. Some remove uh, hard doctrines and make it appealing to the world. Either they twist God's word or adding tradition, people reject the law of God. And even people reject the kindness of God. People are not grateful to God. They say thanks to God, but their lives fail to show gratitude to God. You see, action speaks louder than what? Words. James said, I will show you my faith by my works. And so the world rejects God's law. They reject God's kindness. And today we want to consider verses 15 to 17. Sorry, verses 15 to 18. Rejection of God's work. That is verses 15 to 17. And rejection of God's nature in verse 18. And I believe that this is very crucial uh, for all of us because some of us this morning need a new heart. Some of us had been in the church for many years, but never been born again and still rejecting God. Perhaps not with lips, but with life. Perhaps some of us don't really care about the the works of God and the nature of God this morning. Uh, The person and work of Christ are not really important to you. And so I think it is important to talk about this right at the beginning of the year. Really, this is very crucial because this will set the direction of your life this year. If you are not in Christ, your plans this year are futile, uh, your hope is dying, your destiny is destruction. You see, chapter 5 begins with the Lord Jesus Returning to Jerusalem, it says in verse 1, There is a feast of the Jews, and as he reached the sheep gate, there there he saw multitudes of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, just laying there, uh, desperate, destitute, uh, useless. They're waiting for support and comfort, and that pictures uh, the world we live today, full of people who are hopeless, destitute, filled with spiritually dead people, destined to hell, hopeless, and incapable to save himself. That's what we have, whatever year. People are continuously rejecting God. The Lord Jesus uh, singled out this man who had been sick for 38 years. He healed him and commanded him in verse 8, to get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. And that ignited the conflict. And it said in verse 16, the Jews were persecuting Christ, and the hatred escalated uh, to plans of murdering him in verse 18. And so this is a, an intense rejection of God. And there's two reasons why. You can see there in verse 16 and verse 18 the phrase, For this reason. For this reason. So let's look at the first one. Verses um, 15 to 17. Rejection of God's work. Rejection of God's work. In verse 15, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. There's verse 16. For this reason. The Jews were persecuting Christ or Jesus because he was doing this things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. In verse 15, we read the man went away. After the very strong warning in verse 14, 
Jesus said to him, Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse happens to you. And what's worse than being sick for almost 40 years? What's worse than that? What else could be worse than that? No doubt, it's hell. He's been tormented by sickness for 38 years. He knows the uh, hopeless feeling of that. And it's just a foretaste of hell, a place of eternal agony and torture. It's a place of, of no cure. It's a place of no hope. It's a place of no mercy and no grace. And it's a place of no return. That's the worst thing that can happen to him. And that's the worst thing that can happen to you. If you reject Christ, even Job in his agony uh, vented this frustration. If you turn your Bibles to Job chapter 3, he says there in verse 3, Let the day perish on which I was to be born. And the night which said a boy is conceived, may that day be darkness, Job said. Going down to verse 11, he said, Why did I not die at birth? Come forth from the womb and expire. Why is light given to him who suffers and life to the bitter of soul? How long for death? Sorry, in verse 21, Who long for death, but there is none, he said. What a frustration. And the man who sick for 38 years thought, about that for sure. And you've been probably been frustrated like that. And now the Lord of heaven um, healed him and gave him the foretaste of heaven. He warned him. He called him to repentance. But he just what? He just went away. He departed. He ignored the warning like many of us. We just ignored the warning. Not only that, in, ver in verse 15 it says, He told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. He turned Jesus in. And the word told, we see here in verse 15, it means laying an argument at rest. To bring the message to closure. In other words, he was saying to the Jews, the search is over. Now I know who healed me. His name is Jesus. And so don't blame me. Blame him. And this erupted anger on the part of the, the Jews. And they made a beeline to the Lord of glory. And this is the usual reaction of religious leaders to Christ. In, in, in Mark chapter 3, verse 6, we can read the Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. In Luke chapter 6, verse 11, it says, But they themselves were, were filled with rage and discussed together what they might do to Jesus. And perhaps you ask, um, are they that bad? meaning the religious leaders, are they that evil? The answer to that is no. The religious leaders were righteous in the eyes of the world. There are certain kinds of work uh, that they accept on the Sabbath. There are things they approve on the Sabbath. For example, uh, it's okay for them to lose an ox or donkey from the stall to lead them to the water. They're okay with that. It's not a Sabbath violation because denying uh, the beast with the necessities of life would be cruel. And so they care about necessities of life. They're not that evil. In fact, they even allow circumcision on the Sabbath because God commanded every newborn male on the eighth day to be circumcised. And they allow that work to be done on the Sabbath. Let me give you an example. In John chapter 7, you can turn your Bibles there. This is what the Lord Jesus used in an argument in John 7. In verse 21, Jesus said, or Jesus answered them, I did one deed and you all marvel. 
For this reason, Moses has given you circumcision. Not because it is from Moses, but from the fathers. Meaning to say, the circumcision is commanded to Abraham before Moses. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. What Jesus is saying there, is that fair? You see, you're allowing this on the Sabbath, circumcision, and I just did one, one thing, and now you're angry with me? And so the religious leaders have some considerations, actually. But what Jesus did is not one of their lists. That's the problem. Therefore, the Lord Jesus is a lawbreaker. In the eyes of the Jews, listen, persecuting Christ is a just thing. Why? Because he is a lawbreaker. And the Pharisees are the, the law protector. Hating him, driving him out is just the right thing to do. He, he broke the Sabbath anyway. And the Jews kept the Sabbath. You see, people who reject, people who reject the works of God, listen, believe that they're doing the right thing. People who reject the works of God, they believe that they're doing the right thing. You better believe that. In John 16, you can turn your Bibles there. John 16, verse 1 to 4. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, These things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. In other words, do not be surprised. They will make you outcast from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he's offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. And so these people think they're doing the right thing. They're rejecting God, but they think that they are serving God, that they're offering this service to God. Now, how did Jesus respond to their hatred? Jesus said, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. And so we ask, what do we mean by the term working? So let's do some, um, have a categories here, kind of systematic theology. And last time we spoke about the, the work of the father and the work of the son is different in terms of roles. They have the same mind. They have the same essence, they have the same goal, they have the same will, but they're different in terms of roles. What, what do we mean by that? Of course, the Father plans, the Son accomplishes, and the Spirit applies the plan. That's their role. They have different role because they're a different person. And then we mentioned the work of the Son in redemption, the work of the Son in reconciliation, in propitiation, and the work of conquest. And what unifies those works, we talked about that last time, is the obedience of Christ. The main ingredient of that uh, works, uh, reconciliation, propitiation, and redemption, is the obedience of Christ. That's what unifies it. But I want to expand this idea of working a little bit. There's what we call the, the external and internal work of God. Very important categories. The, the external works of God are works done in time. Works done in time. It is visible to us. You can know it. It is known to us. The Lord Jesus entered time and space to do the works of God, which cannot be denied. Part of the external works of God is creation. It's visible. It is known to us. In Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, but men 
reject it anyway, Romans chapter 1. And as the Lord Jesus reveals God's power and glory, here healing the sick man as he created a new health, as he created a new life, instantly, uh, completely, they ignore that. They ignore that. You see, people reject even the uh, visible work of God. Even if it's really clear, they just reject that. And if you cannot convince the world with Genesis chapter 1, if you cannot convince the world with creation, you cannot persuade them with John 3.16. You better believe that. If they reject Genesis chapter 1, which is visible, they will reject John 3.16. Another external work of God is providence. Let's talk about that a little bit. So John Gill said, Providence means all the creatures God has made are preserved, governed, guided, and directed. It is through God's wisdom, power, and goodness. End quote. And there is what we call the, uh, the immediate providence of God. There is uh, when God exercises himself without any means or cause or second causes. It is immediate. There's no need of instrument. And the counterpart of that is the mediate providence, which is exercised in the use of means. And so why are we mentioning this? Well, we see here that the religious leaders were rejecting the immediate providence of God. They didn't see God was working in their means. Jesus said, my father is working I myself am working. The Father is in heaven, but I'm here working, doing the works of my Father. That's God working in their midst. Immediate providence. Rejected it anyway. Well, there is also the uh, extraordinary providence of God, which is actually works of miracle. This is when God goes out of his common way. There are two ways that God can act in the world, miracle and providence. And miracle has no natural explanation. That's why Jesus didn't try to explain himself why, why he did what he did, because only God can do miracle. And so they rejected the uh, external works of God. They rejected the immediate work of God and the extraordinary works of God. These people have no excuse. These people have no excuse. Now what about the internal works of God? If the external works of God are done in time, the internal works of God are done in eternity. It is strange for us. This is God's work that is beyond our capacity to understand. And one of the internal works of God are His purposes, His decrees. He has purposes in your life this year that you don't know. And these are purpose in Himself. It is personal to Him. These are the deep things of God, only known by Himself. For example, the immanent work of God, immanent work of God. This work is in God. It remains and abides in Him until He revealed it to us. And here we see in John chapter 5, the reason why I'm mentioning here, Jesus is revealing God to the Jews. When He calls God His own Father and making Himself equal with God, He's revealing and explaining the nature of God. To them. It was veiled before. It was hidden before. But now it is uncovered to them. But they rejected him. Even Philip asked Jesus to show us the Father. If you look at John 14 for a moment, in John chapter 14, verses 8. 
sorry, verse 8 to 12. John 14, verse 8, Philip said to him, and, and pay attention to the word works. It is repeated many times here. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise believe because of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will, all, he will do also in greater works than this. He will do because I go to the Father. Now listen, God's work is not only immanent, but also free. Free. The free acts of his will. He, he cannot be forced. A God cannot be influenced. When the Lord Jesus healed the sick men and lived the rest to their uh, dreadful state, He's free to do that. He will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. When he hides the things of the gospel from the wise and prudent and reveals the gospel to the babes, he is free to do that. That is part of his internal work. When Jesus said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, it means he is free to do whatever he wants with the Sabbath. He doesn't have to explain himself. The internal works of God, it's not only imminent, it's not only free, but also unchangeable and effectual. Unchangeable and effectual. His works cannot be frustrated or dismayed. That's the works of God. Nothing can stop the plan and, and purpose and decrease of God. No unforeseen event can, can put a stop to God's work. And that's what the religious leaders are trying to do. They're trying to stop the, the works of God. Hindering God's work by their man-made laws. And suddenly the religious leaders have now the, the right uh, to dictate the terms of the law of God. Suddenly they have this leadership rights to just do whatever they want with the law of God. And you and I must be mindful because we have our own version of that. Suddenly, the churches now have the right to prioritize tradition over worship and setting aside the work of God at church for Christmas celebration. And many churches decided not to meet last Sunday. Prioritizing tradition over the God's command. Steve Lawson said, Jesus did not came to make a holiday. He came to save sinners. And what concerns me a lot are professing Christians, claiming to be Christians, people who think and believe that they're believers in God, that they are serving God, that they honor God, that, they, that they're interested in the law of God, that they are the guardians of the honor of God, they're zealous in the name of God, always say their prayer, they serve actively, they attend regularly, and when you ask them, are you going to heaven? And they will say, well, I try to do my best. I'm not perfect, but I certainly try to please God. And when you ask them about their sin, they will not reject it. They will admit it. I am a sinner. And they and they will say, but God is merciful. He is forgiving. He is loving. These people say the right things. But never really have a relationship with the Son. They don't even mention His name. They don't even treat Him as a person. 
a person who has a mind, a person who has a heart and will, that he is king as a person. He is king, but reject his kingship, his rule. And we don't want him to take control of our lives, right? We don't even include him in our vacation planning. We don't even include him in our family planning. He's a king. He's a person. We should include him. Let me ask you this. Is that how it goes with you? Have you really treated him as a sovereign person in your life? He's a person. Don't forget that. How about Christ as a priest? A person, a priest. A person who is sympathetic. A high priest who can understand our weakness. A person who can mediate for us in times of trouble, in times of temptation. Is that true for you? Do you really believe he has a mind? Do you really believe that he has a heart and will and to intercede for us? Do you really believe that he's there mediating for you in times of need? What about him as a prophet, a person, a prophet who proclaims God's word to us? Some of us don't even read our Bible every day or perhaps you, you study your Bible, but you're too over-familiar with it. And you've been studying the Bible and praying since forever. And you've read it many times. You've been, a, you've been at church for so long. It's like, you know, marriage. You've been, you've been together for many years, but your relationship with your spouse hasn't really grown that much. You're familiar with the habits. You know the likes and the dislikes. Uh, you know the personality, and you're too over-familiar with it, and now the respect is gone. The honor is gone, over too familiar. And the relationship becomes dry. It becomes uh, mechanical. It becomes ordinary, and the same is true with our relationship with Christ. We become too familiar with Him that we don't honor him, our affections are empty, dry, and we ignore him. We, we actually overlook him, and we don't prioritize him as a person. As a person. He is a person. And does that describe you? I pray that we don't reject him like that. You see, rejection of Christ can be fast, Rejection of Christ can be immediate, can be sudden, but most of the time, listen, rejection of Christ is slow and gradual. The religious leaders rejected his work because they overlook him, they miss the point, they have the word of God, they've been waiting for the Messiah for many years, and now the Messiah is right in their faces but they rejected and hated him. Rejected and hated his works. Now the second rejection that we see here in verse 18, rejection of God's nature. Look at verse 18. It says, For this reason, therefore the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Why? Because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Well, because of the Lord's reply in verse 17, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. Listen, verse 17 describes for us that the works of Christ is not dependent on God the Father. What he's doing is not dependent on God the Father. It is coordinated with the Father. And the Jews understand this very well because in the ancient Eastern mindset, the Son is the extension of the Father. It's not the Father is different from the Son or the Son different from the Father. The Son is the extension of the Father. They, they know that. And with that single phrase, the Lord Jesus is actually claiming equality with God. With that single phrase, 
My father is working until now. I myself am working. The Jews understand that. You are claiming to be God. In verse 18 said, For this reason, therefore the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. And, and the therefore implies the, the intensity of their anger. Therefore, it's, it, it tells us that this is uh, irreparable, irreconcilable. And they swore to be his enemies. They see Christ not only as a lawbreaker, but making himself equal with God. And therefore, God, he is God, equal in power and authority, uh, the same essence and glory. And you ask, how did that happen? How did that happen? How come the Father and Son are one and yet different? How come they're co-eternal, co-equal? They're one God, but different person. How come? Answer, I don't know. I don't know. We don't attempt to understand that. In fact, we are not meant to understand that. We cannot even understand ourselves. I don't understand myself, let alone God. I don't understand Him. Why do we have one God yet three persons? How can a finite mind understand that? Paul said in Romans 11, who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor? Only God understands himself. We believe it, we receive it, we obey it, and those who try to understand the triunity of God is doomed for destruction. And if you reject it, you're doomed as well. So if you try to understand it, you're doomed to failure. And if you reject it, you're also doomed. This claim, this is a claim that only God can understand. And Jesus repeatedly claimed to be God. He affirmed this without hesitation. In Mark 14, he said, um, are you, he was asked, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And then he said, you shall, you shall see uh, the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. In Luke 22, verse 70, he said, uh, he was asked again, are you the Son of God? And he said to them, yes, I am. The Lord Jesus embraced that without saying sorry. He is God. And since um, He's God in flesh, so the Sabbath restriction doesn't really apply to Him. He removed the Sabbath. He doesn't have to explain Himself for doing that. In fact, in chapter 2, John chapter 2, He cleansed the temple. He, he actually abolished the temple sacrifice. Why? Well, he's God in flesh. He doesn't have to explain himself. He can do that because that's his father's house. So today, if you hear his voice, do not reject him. Do not harden your heart. Turn to him, Christ. Receive him. Do not reject him. Seek him while he may be found. Th throw yourself to Christ. Throw yourself to Christ. Take his yoke upon you and, and learn from him, for he's gentle and kind, and you will find rest for your soul. Believe him for who he is, and he will cleanse you as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgression from us. And today is the appointed time for you to receive forgiveness. And you want to consider that this year. Believe in, in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Why? For he came to seek and save the lost. He didn't came for the righteous. He didn't came for the righteous. He came for the sinners. 
like you and me. And if you're here, the voice of the great shepherd right now, and then follow his voice, he will lead you to green pastures. He will restore your soul. And even if you walk in the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil. For his rod and staff will comfort you. And surely his goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's what he promised. And you better believe that. Let's pray. Receive him. Don't reject him. Father, we're thankful for your son. The only person who knows us better, better than us, better than ourselves. Help us, O oh God, to know him more, to have a relationship with him. We find ourselves sometimes dry in our worship, dry in our study, dry in our prayer. We're we're so uh, busy with the busyness of life. Even myself, I was drained throughout this week with, with work. And so it's really a joyful thing to be here, to study once more, to be refreshed, to be renewed. Oh God, show us mercy. Help us, oh God, direct us, lead us down to green pastures. Help us, oh God, we need our soul to be restored, to be refreshed. And only through him, your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that these things can happen. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit giving us conviction, giving us understanding. Help us now, God, to apply these things in Christ's name. Amen.